Joe, welcome to Forte Podcast. Thank you. Such a pleasure to have you here yeah, again. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you. And to meet again. Yes. So when was the last time I, I it, saw you? It's been about four or five years, I think. Yes. Um, since I saw you in Cardiff. Um, yeah, you've been keeping well. Yes, I have. <laughs> Absolutely. And you too. Yeah. Not so bad. for the people who don't know, um, when I was at Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, Joe Davis was my composition supervisor for my final year. And uh, and it's also your birthday today, so thank you very much for inviting me on your birthday. <laughs> Feel very honoured. Yeah, yeah, no, not at all. Not so, at all. It's a coincidence, but it's a fun thing to do. Yes, yeah. yes. So correct me if I'm wrong. You've been at the Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama since 2013. Yeah. Would that be correct? Yeah, that's great. Right. Yeah, and you've been teaching composition there. Yes, I have. Fantastic. Yeah, or trying to. <laughs> <laughs> um. I like to just start off the conversation with the notion of teaching composition. Yeah. <laughs> um, can you give us some insight on how to teach composition? Because I've talked to a few composers and they've also struggled with the idea of the concept of teaching someone how to compose, how to write well in music. And yeah. I've, I've wanted to see what your insights were into pedagogical. Yeah. Insight. Yeah, well, it's it's really hard, and I think it's the same with any creative discipline, I think. Um, and I think I imagine it's hard for any discipline that you're teaching to the extent that the thing you're teaching is technical or not technical. In other words, I think there are things you can teach which are mostly technical things. Yes. Um, and there are things that you can't really teach, at least not in the same way, which mm -hmm. is anything aside from technique, um, that you can offer suggestions it's hard to know it's much more intuitive that side of teaching mm. um, you can have a method for teaching technique in other words um, one question I suppose people have with composition just in general is what is technique anyway because it's not as obvious as it is I think say with um, instrumentalists yeah where if you're a pianist you're practicing scales and arpeggios and all the rest of it and of course other um, repetitive things but it's you c it's happening there someone's actually doing something that you can see in here um, you can practice there are things you can practice as a composer but they're less visible to someone you know if you watch something composing what are they doing they're sitting there <laughs> making all these hieroglyphic marks um, which don't mean much to a lot of people um, but it's it is there it's to do with it's to do with understanding how sounds move in relation to each other um i mean traditionally it's to do with harmony and counterpoint i suppose right formal formal harmony and counterpoint exercises which people used to do a lot of in the past and in a decreasing way um as time goes on um i i actually when i got to um, would it have been the end of school doing A-levels? Um, the Even at that time, the syllabus that we had, I think it was either you would do composition or some kind of formal harmony counterpoint exercise, mm -hmm. which seems a bit odd because they definitely, one is part of the other very much, you know? Mm -hmm. um, they're kind of a formal and, and practical si uh, two sides of the same thing. So it meant that um, when I went to uni, um, in doing interviews and things some places you know you would actually need these skills that I'd never practiced mm. and it wasn't the fault of my teachers in school it was just the syllabus had been gradually kind of watered down over the years I think um, and one of my teachers actually gave me a when I went off to interviews um, a book of you know hum, how to harmonize bar chorals <laughs> and that kind of thing I think that I literally read in the car on the way there <laughs> which really helped um, so thanks for that um, <laughs> but yeah it's it's um it's so it's something that you can you can you can do exercises for but that doesn't necessarily apply to all um genres of music that people would be would be interested in um writing um at least not in an explicit way but the, the these these things like they do for pianists i suppose you know if you're practicing scales um it's obviously useful for something like a Mozart concerto, which has loads of actual scales in it. But it's it's useful for you just generally in terms of finger agility, right? Even if you're not playing that repertoire, even if you're playing Scriabin or something that doesn't have all this um, up and down stuff. So it's kind of like going to the gym or something for just general 
fluency you know and it's like it does it is like that for composition as well you know if you do those if you do those kinds of exercises and even kinds of pastiche writing that we had to do Hmm. um, on my undergrad um, it really helps It's, it's very hard to 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 say exactly how when your music no longer sounds anything like that um but the principles are there right the principles of how one melody moves against another how one chord moves against after another voice leading and all that um applies to everything you know i've done i've done a certain amount of collaborations with pop artists and that kind of thing um the last few years and even there it's useful (laughs) in fact there are sometimes it's even more useful than it is um in other kinds of music because the the chords are more like the music of say the the 19th century than a lot of the the notated music of the last 50 years mm. right um yeah what so. you you mentioned pastiches that you did what do you remember any of those oh we had to um we had to write string quartets in the style of Haydn and that kind of thing. I mean, we'd get a few bars of, of pieces and then have to complete them. Um, we had to harmonize, you know, you'd get one line maybe of a piano sonata. It's the kind of thing you get, it, a more advanced kind of version of the kind of thing you get in grade eight theory, actually, still, mm. um, which I had to help someone with recently and suddenly thought, Oh God, uh, it's years since I've looked at this stuff and had to relearn some of it practically. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, no, it was great. But it was a really steep learning curve because I'd never really done it before. Mm. And uh, our, you know, our tutor was hardcore and old school, and was his take was if you don't know how to do this, then you need to learn immediately. So that just makes right. you, <laughs> and makes you read up and and practice. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. what do you think is the purpose of doing pastiches is it to to famili- familiarize yourself with the past and not necessarily repeat it but what, what do you think is the reason for doing pasti- pastiches in composition um for those technical things mm-hmm. to try to try to, to to work through i think for me the way the way i've come to understand it is the more kinds of music you can inhabit, um, the less you're operating on a stylistic level, actually, and that you start getting to the almost archetypal principles and shapes behind style, right? Which are there. They're very hard to describe because this is the, this is the thing with notated notated music, right? Um, all we have are the dots, but they're I, I heard a good um, analogy about this from a, I think it was from a jazz guitarist. I can't remember who exactly, who said um, that you know dots on a page, notated music are like the footprints of some kind of creature or musical animal that's moving, and the trick is to to get to what that animal is, not to just be stuck with the footprints. Mm. Right, and that works both ways. That's for performers to do. You know, working back towards what the composer was why those notes are the way they are but it's also for composers to find um because i think i find with a lot of of students and and with thinking back to myself in the past as well you get caught in notation you know it's a kind of um it can be a trap because you start believing in the notes too much as the most important thing about the music that it also almost becomes a visual thing more than a Mm. um uh, an auditory thing um that's one big thing I think that happened in the 20th century. I think modernism um, is an example of a kind of mannerist way of thinking about notation, right? It becomes at least as important for some composers as the as the sounds it's representing. Mm-hmm. And it's not something unique to the last 50, 60 years, 100 years. Um, you know, you look at long-term musical history and it's happened before. You know, you could see the late Baroque, even J.S. Bach or something like that, um, I think that's a really lovely, actually, balance of, <laughs> you know, visual and and um, and sound. But there was certainly a reaction against it, right? Mm. The next generation or two of musicians reacted against that, what they saw as a heavy, cerebral kind of way of, of setting down music. Um, end of the Middle Ages as well, 1380s, 90s, as a, there's a movement called the Ars Subtilior, um, which is great fun. You know, it's really wacky, 
amazingly detailed sort of staves going in all directions and things really playing with the visual aspect of music and and doing hyper complicated things um and it's furthest from folk music then you know that's the thing um the question was about um pastiche wasn't it originally and the value of it and yes why um yeah so it's to get through that to get through those things and see them as relative somehow so that they would they're all just tools so that notation just becomes a tool and not the thing that you're uh not an end in itself right right you're, you're using it to get to whatever the 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 living idea is of the music this kind of animal that makes the footprints which mm-hmm. are the notes you know mm-hmm. Um, very hard to do um, and it there's so much technique you need to learn um, to write music as it's written now that um, it can very easily stifle spontaneity it's difficult um, and there are various ways of getting around that that people have tried hmm. um, yeah and so a lot of the time I'm I'm getting my students away from notation for a bit often so that they don't take the notes too seriously. They don't get bogged down in just manipulating visual stuff on the page, you know, trying to get back to just even getting them to sing or play. Or, I mean, I do this with, with younger kids, obviously, as well, because that's because they have much less knowledge. But even people who have a lot of knowledge, it's important to get away from it sometimes and just improvise, just record yourself, whatever it is, get back to the physicality of music. I think that's one thing that, um, it was in danger of losing maybe right the last mm. 50 years or so in in certain ways mm-hmm. that's why pop music kind of came in to fill that gap actually yep. <laughs> i think right students uh composition students um what musical characteristics and personalities in a student that stands out to you in their works or in their personalities what what strikes you um about any of them so what kind of things are likely to to make an impression yeah. on you yeah that's a tricky one because it one thing i've i've realized is that you know it it goes without saying that everyone's different mm-hmm. but i really haven't had two people who are anything alike in those 7 years or so wow. of teaching which is crazy really you know you think you think you're going to get a couple of people who'll have a certain kind of niche um but they're not. They're they're all. What strikes me is their individuality, um, and that they're all people who are struggling to make themselves clear um, to the world through this very strange, <laughs> arcane way of of setting down sounds on paper. You know, mm-hmm. um, it's a process of clarifying your own personality mm-hmm. um, to yourself, I think, and to the world if you're creating anything. Yes. Um, and creating music um, is a fascinating and very difficult way of, of doing that, um, but very rewarding mm. um, when it goes well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and I want to go back slightly mm. to when you were saying how you uh, were talking about melody. Mm. Um, music has many elements melody, harmony, rhythm, tonality, meter, structure, instrumentation. Mm. When you're composing a new piece, um, which elements come first for you when you're trying to put a piece together? Mm. Um, or is it a complicated sequence of all, for example, melody first, and then you think about structure, then you go back to instrumentation? Mm. Or is there another approach? Um, anything. It could be anything. anything. It could be really anything. Um I think it's it's usually something it, usually things go well if there's something spontaneous that actually is not broken down into those components. Um I think this is uh something that a notational way of thinking encourages, right? You have rhythm, um vertical harmony, melody which is a kind of horizontal version of harmony in a way. I think mm. they're definitely two sides of the same coin. Um but y- I'm not convinced that's how people would always have thought about music, you know, in these in these very strictly mm-hmm. stratified boxes. And I'm also not convinced, although um, although I don't have enough knowledge about, you know, different cultures 
around the world to say for sure but i i'd be surprised if it's how all cultures thought of it as well um and i think something unmediated and spontaneous is important right um something that's not calculated there's two there's two things you're doing um as a, a composer of notated music you're you're kind of analytically looking at what you have um how you could manipulate it how you could improve it um but it comes hopefully from from something that you can't analyze and describe mm. initially which is an idea of some sort mm. right um <laughs> and it, that's the hard thing that you know what, what what where does that come from i don't know um it's usually something that that you you just start find yourself playing or tapping or singing or whatever that might have all of those elements just at once that just happen could be tiny usually it'll be small sometimes if you're lucky you'll get a big whole section like that Mm -hmm. um but it's a balance so it's going back and forth between having those ideas analyzing them doing something with them um that will lead to another idea on top of what you've done. Then you go back to the analytical way. It's a back and forth of these very... T- I, th- I feel like they're two brains almost. They're two mm-hmm. quite distinct um, kinds of thinking that you need both of. You really need both of to, to do something good with notated music. You don't need both of them so much if you're... Um, or I imagine I'm I'm not, so I I don't know for sure. But I imagine you don't if you're if you're doing something in an oral tradition, right? Because you need a memory. Then you need to remember the you know the basics of what you've inherited from other singers in the folk tradition you're in, or whatever it is. Um, and you need the spontaneity and passion of the moment of the performance you're in. But it's less. I feel like it's probably less less analytical. Um, there's just something about the visual aspect of notated music, which is very kind of left brain, as far as I understand the diff- the way the two hemispheres of the brain work, right? Um, there's a great book about that. Um, Ian McGilchrist is the name of the guy, mm-hmm. The Master and His Emissary, amazing book about the hem- two hemispheres of the brain. Yes. And that the left is the one that um, codifies experience and makes it into some kind of form that can be that can you can use then to predict the future right to make the world a bit more manageable um but the right brain is about uh, openness non-specificity if that's a word um and just uh, spontaneously taking in the whole scene of whatever it is you're doing you know you're more in that frame of mind in most kinds of of musical performance i think um and I think it's really important for composers to be able to be in that frame of mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also harder to teach that kind of thinking, right? Um, and most people uh, will be strong on one side or the other of that. So they'll, for example, be a student who is very technically proficient, but struggles with drying up on the ideas side or not knowing necessarily what makes something better or worse in their work right they find it hard to judge quality that kind of thing whereas another kind of student who might be the extreme other sort will have very good ideas and is very sure about what they do and don't want to do but finds it difficult just to sort of build a piece from these ideas right to extend the ideas into something that makes sense as a structure um and it's much easier to teach that second kind of person <laughs> you know just from a selfish kind of way like uh, as a teacher but it, there's nothing I can do about that it, it's more obvious to know what to do with that kind of student because you go right this is great these ideas are fantastic let's do x y and z have you thought about turning this upside down you know that have you thought about putting that over there whatever um if if that comes all just second nature to someone but they they're wondering why they would do it and with what kind of idea and and how to get an idea you know what would you say what would you say (laughs) where do ideas come from for you um are they quite spontaneous well that's the problem isn't it the the reason it's harder to know what to say is because what would you do what do i do if i have that problem um do something else go for a walk it's all the cliches isn't it you know go for a walk um if you have enough time which is rare you know 
go somewhere you've never been before. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Travel seems to be really good for ideas. I don't know why, (laughs) but a lot of the time, those, those intuitive things, which are not analytical, I feel like for me, they sort themselves out on train journeys Mm. or, or at whatever kind of long, long journey, long walk. Um, especially no especially transport (laughs) there must be someone must have done a study on that like transport and and inspiration or whatever Mm -hmm. but um yeah it's it's you just you just you can't account for it you know you you can't know when it's gonna uh, um when those things are gonna click or, or not but you can certainly um make the conditions optimal for them right doing so right so you try to do that. And of course, you know, when I said it's much easier to teach that other kind of person, it's no less fun actually helping someone who's more like the other kind of thing because things tend to be perhaps more philosophical in tone um, when you're talking to, to those people. Mm-hmm. Um, you're talking about why they're doing what they're doing, um, trying to understand that on a deep level. You know, it's it's not a very pragmatic thing um, it's not a pragmatic way to make a living, for example. Hmm. Um, so why do it? But they, they do want to do it because they're there with you, you know? So it's, it's get, I think a lot of the time when they reattach or re, um, they get back into contact with those deep reasons for wanting to do it, then, then ideas will just come from being excited again about whatever it was. It's easy to lose that Hmm. for me, for everyone, I think, and anyone creative it's where, you know, writer's block comes mm-hmm. from yes mm-hmm. there's a there's a widely known philosophy that failure is important for success yeah i was wondering if i could be just open question open-ended for a bit mm. um i was wondering if you could speak on f- notion of failure with yeah. composition yeah, yeah. Where, where do you stand on this <laughs> yeah wow well, um you can start anywhere you like. It's really important um, to have, well, one way of putting it that springs to mind is negative experiences when they arise are very useful. And I think um, it would be a shame if uh, um, things, you know, people got so concerned about people feeling um hard done by in whatever way that they never allowed others or themselves to risk real failure um or even small kinds of failure i mean one example i remember writing a piece for um an orchestra um in would have been in oxford towards the end of of my undergrad and um just making some basic mistake about producing the parts you know like not knowing something really obvious i can't remember what it was um and um uh one of the musicians literally you know coming out of the orchestra in a rehearsal like up to me in front of everyone and just saying how the hell am i supposed to read that and that's you know you just never do that again because it's sort of mortifying (laughs) you know Mm. so things like that um it's it's actually great It, it can be it can be mortifying in a moment when you're put in that kind of situation but it's good that there are kinds of people who are bold enough to, to do that kind of thing, you know, to, to, to young composers. I, I actually, I'm not being disingenuous here. I think, it, <laughs> you know, there's all sorts of, it's good that there's all sorts of um, characters uh, of musician, you know, in an orchestra, for example, that's such a good example. It's such a cross section. It always seems to be a cross section of different character types. You know, there's something in the stereotypes of certain kind of people play this certain kind of people play that. It's, it's really true, really true. Um, non-classical musicians seem to be really surprised when they they realize that is kind of true or when classical musicians say yeah that is true you know there, there's these types people are just sort of amazed by it somehow but but it but it is true anyway to go back um negative experiences you learn very quickly from more quickly than from positive experiences right um and that's it's useful it's useful um I like, uh, you know, you do have a lot of things like workshops and uh, and things in colleges where you have you have pieces played and talked about by whoever's leading it and then the players and everything. And when, yeah, when 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 things really don't work, 
it's often very, very useful, not just for that composer, but for everyone there. Whereas if something is very technically, um, you know, is technically fine and, and sight readable, um, maybe deliberately it's been contrived that way. The comp composer's not has avoided taking any, any risks or going outside their comfort zone, perhaps, um, which is another point, but, mm -hmm. um, then you, it, it's still valuable, but you don't you don't necessarily have have as much takeaway. Um, you'd think, hopefully, when it's like that, that that it would open up time to talk about aesthetics and things like that. But mm. people usually don't have the guts to talk about that <laughs> publicly. It's really yeah. true, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because we live in a relativistic world where you don't want to you don't really want to say what you think of something. <laughs> 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 it's very rare to have honesty about you know what people like and don't like when it comes to to new stuff um yeah i like to just bring it back to your earlier days you you yeah. studied at oxford first and yeah. then you went to the royal academy let's start with oxford why oxford um wow um it seemed uh, oh i think i think my teachers thought i was clever enough to get in i think it was literally that mm. you know um it, i was one of these people who i was kind of good at everything in school mm -hmm. um and they there was some open day or something and i i went there with a few people it was really beautiful i mean it's an amazing place kind of why wouldn't you want to go there i suppose right? <laughs> somewhere like that to study yes um yeah, it's funny. I didn't. I mean, one one thing is that I n I now teach at the 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 Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama, as you said, um, a conservatoire, not a university. Um, I didn't know. Did I? No, I didn't know. Um, at the end of school, that you even could study just something like composition, you know, as a practical degree. Um, maybe if I had known that, because I'd I'd been writing all all through school, you know. Um, so I was 11 or something like that. And um, yeah, I probably would have applied for something like that. In hindsight, for me, just for, for how I am, uh, you know, my character, I'm glad I didn't. I, for, some, for some people, it's great. You know, some people are ready to just specialize in that one thing. I'm glad I, I liked the academic side of things. You know, I like history and, and all of that. I was I was very curious about everything and it was good to have a very wide, I mean, it was, you know, it was, a uh, your horizons kind of explode coming from a, uh, you know, state comprehensive school going somewhere like that. Yeah. Um, quite amazing. Yeah. Do you think that academic training at Oxford set you up well for Royal Academy? Um, it's, uh, not really because, because of that same thing that the, the academy is a conservatoire, so it's more practical. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we had to do a little bit of academic stuff there. Not very much. Um, no, it was just very, very different. You know, it was, and I, I didn't have any gaps or anything. That's one thing I might've done actually, if I went back, um, I would have maybe taken some time between things, but you know, things just end up how they do. But I went straight from school to undergrad, undergrad to London and it was all, yeah, it was very sudden changes mm. you know real really sudden changes at those times when i went to the new place um yeah yeah so a very different experience coming here or to london yes yeah to do the masters mm. are there are there any things you wish you did whilst you were a student that you didn't do looking back in hindsight something that you wish you did more of no 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 really in honesty um no, it was great. It was a great time. Mm -hmm. I worry, I do worry a little <laughs> as someone who's kind of, you know, I, I, well, what's the way of saying this? I worry a little bit that with things like rising tuition fees that have happened um, oh, since I left study, you know, that, that, um, that there's a kind of seriousness. It might just be a generational thing. But my students are very serious about, um, in a good way, you know, on, in one sense, of course, that's a good thing. I, I worry that they don't feel like they can, they have time to relax sometimes. Right. You know? 
Mm-hmm. And I feel like that was one really good thing about my student time. It was a, that was a, in a good kind of balance, re- relaxation, just discovering things and having a good time as well as working, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I sometimes feel like they, they work a lot harder than I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think a healthy balance is what is needed. Sometimes yeah. you can't work all the time. It's true. Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, it's people really burn out. You know, it's, it's yes. easily done, especially when you're doing something creative and you don't want to say no to anything and you get offered, you know, to do music for a play and then this piece and then this piece. And before you know it, you have, you know, five deadlines in a <laughs> month or whatever. And it's crazy. Yeah. That can happen. Mm. Um, yeah, that's something everyone learns somehow, you know, to, to pace things out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, music can be seen as a form of language, as a form of communication. Um, I don't know if the cameras can pick it up, but you have two bookshelves here full of books mm. from top to bottom. Mm. Uh, you have a passion for poetry, his- musical history and history and philosophy books. Mm. Do, you, do you see a connection between your love of music and composing music with your love of language and books? Is there a connection? Probably, but it's it's kind of like everything feeds into that. Mm-hmm. Um, music's strange because it's very um, abstract, in the sense that it 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 can you can pin things on it, but it doesn't necessarily define it. Like mm. you could play someone a piece of film music that they might understand in the absence of the visuals of the film in a completely different way mm-hmm. from what was intended. And actually, I think, you know, if you if you could go back into the past and play someone in the 18th century, a John Williams soundtrack, Star Wars or something, or even play um, someone somewhere on the other side of the world who's never seen a film like that or anything like it. Yeah. The same thing. Um, I very much doubt they would have, you know, droids and spaceships and things going around in their head. Yeah. Uh, and not just that, I don't think the emotional response would be anything like it. Um, so there's that. And also, <laughs> I'll have to re-edit this. This is a really weird, this is a funny one to think about. <laughs> what was the, what was the exact question? It's to do with, um, does, yeah, does the, do the books feed into, into, um, and vice versa. Yeah. Yeah, into music and vice versa and the interest in it. Um It's 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 related to the ideas thing. You know, it's it, they can come from anywhere and that's I think that it's sort of, it's sort of a composting that you do when you read lots of different things. Mm-hmm. Um I feel like probably what in my 20s maybe I spent almost too much time reading various things when I could have been writing more. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I feel like I have a renewed appetite for, for, for writing now. Um, but yeah, I did amass a lot of stuff and this there's a lot more than these, but this is just what there's room for mm. here. Um, yeah, it's all useful. Um, I think that's probably if you're doing anything creative, nothing is not useful to know about or read about because you don't know when something's going to turn into an idea for something musically, you know? Um, yeah, yeah, but the, the language thing and the language of music, I remember having to do an essay on that some time, God knows what I said about it, (laughs) um, probably nonsense, I'm just going to say some more nonsense now, but, (laughs) um, no, it's, it's, it's not a language, I don't think it is, I I don't think it is, you know, oh, okay, um, the, 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 yeah, the Ian McGilchrist, book actually the the master and his emissary about these two brain hemispheres um there was one bit of that where he was talking about music and language and it was i think his thinking or the thinking of someone he was quoting in that that music sort of predates language in terms of evolution so that maybe language kind of emerges out of music somehow and i can believe that that seems intuitively right for me somehow um that animals have music in a way, right? That birds do have, that is music to me. 
and i think to, i really think like to them which is a r- ridiculous thing to say in a way because how could i know but <laughs> it's so like what we do you know when you watch them um there's trees all around out, outside this flat and i see a lot of birds and they they are singing to each other you know hmm. um definitely but i i don't know whether it's like language and it it they certainly don't write anything down or they don't seem to <laughs> yeah you know what i mean yes yeah um so would the corollary question be mm. can everyone make music yeah 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 but i but i don't think everyone's just naturally as good at it as everyone else you know i don't think it's just practice or whatever I, mm-hmm. obviously people are better at it than others f- from birth yeah <laughs> of course um yeah yeah every, but everyone of course everyone can you know you, yeah give someone a drum yeah do you write not music but words do you write i have done yeah i have done i used to write probably quite terrible poetry um no i yeah i was serious about it for a while in my 20s actually yeah um yeah it does come back it comes back in a unpredictable ways sometimes you know I'll just jot something down um i enjoy it yeah i enjoy playing with words for sure um is it just poetry or do you write essays articles or or just journaling for yourself i've dabbled in sort of starting i think i've probably started all sorts of things in my 20s mm-hmm. um that i pro- I'd probably never want to look at again <laughs> um <laughs> but um yeah it's i think it's what you have time to to cultivate and what you have time to push i'd like to have time to 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 take that more seriously you know mm. um perhaps and maybe i will at some point um but at the moment i've got too much other stuff to do um but yeah yeah i do, i i like writing I mean that was part of the the Oxford thing as well. You had to write a lot of words, right? <laughs> like a couple of essays a week and this, that, and the other. Yeah, yeah. I kind of I kind of miss that. Yeah. What comes harder, Com- composing music or composing words for you? Music. Music. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I've never done anything harder than that. <laughs> right i i don't think i i can't really conceive of what what could be harder than that right. actually um i think that's why i think it was the the thing i found that one of the few things like i s- said in my conceited way about being good at everything in school i just was though right it was one of those annoying kids that everyone was like oh you know did you cheat on your exams or whatever <laughs> no uh, I just remembered stuff. Um, <laughs> I have a good memory. That's what it is, right? So when you when you when you're doing GCSEs and A levels, so much of it is about mem- just memorizing facts, right? Being able to recall things. Um, but no, music was. I was um, two of my best friends. Actually, I was in school with our, our brilliant jazz musicians, um, and they're still to, still to this day some of the most natural musicians I've ever met. You know. I've never met anyone who's sort of more a seemingly natural musician than them. And um, I think it, it, it fascinated me that, that you could, that there could be this thing, which you, you is not, um, can't be got at uh, through memorizing things or intellectually in the same way as other subjects could in school. So maybe, maybe I'd be doing something completely different if it wasn't for them you mm. know, or, or having whatever teachers you have at the time. And I mean, certainly, you know, your, your life can just go like that in a different direction. I think in Absolutely. hindsight, it's a strange series of, um, serendipity and coincidence and absolutely, which is the magic of life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is the final question. I wish we could talk for many hours, but. Um, for the podcast sake, we have to um, end it with a final question. Sure. Uh, forgive me if it's a bit too difficult, but I can give you all the time you need. Yeah. So if you could ask one person in history, musical or non-musical, just one question that only they could answer, but the modern society haven't got an answer yet from them, mm. what would that question be and who would it be to? 
Oh, well, okay. So I'm going to have to have a minute to think about that. Yes, of course. So two parts of it. What is a question? Who would I ask this question to? Yes. And the question would be, say that bit again. <laughs> so so uh, yeah. who uh, so who would you ask this question to? Yeah. Musical or non-musical? Yeah. Uh, only they could answer. Yeah. That modern society haven't gotten answered to yet. But I think that this person from the past might have an answer to. Only they could answer, yes. Okay. <laughs> so is it like something that we don't know? Yes. But Only speculation right now. Sure. Only they can confirm this figure in history. Okay. So is someone who was famous for knowing about whatever this thing is, yes. this question? yes. Wow. Anything you like. Hmm. So this this is going to be it's going to be some kind of philosopher, right? It's sure. it's going in that direction because it's such a huge question. It'd have to be it would be someone from the deep mists of time. It would be someone like a pre-Socratic Greek philosopher, like Heraclitus or someone like that I love, who has all these... One of these people, like, most of their writings are lost, but there's just these little fragments of wisdom, right? Um, there's one lovely one about... He's the guy who said the thing about you can't step into the same river twice because even though the shape stays the same the water's all already gone right every single time you're there it's different water and different water um yeah so it might be him but what the question is is you know <laughs> that's two huge two huge questions um yeah what would you ask him hmm I mean, I think he would have a lot to say about lots of aspects of the modern world because I think he sort of points in the direction of monism um, and the idea of things being one, um, like you have in something like Buddhism, right? This idea of, of separation being an illusion. Um, yeah, it's this thing of, uh, it's this thing of fragmentation, actually. This is something we were talking about before the podcast, isn't it? Which is coming back to me. Um, I think that's that's the big that's the big thing that's happened to us in the last hundred years or so, musically, um, in society. This idea that um, that you 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 know you have a certain kind of mainstream or a certain um, pattern of of artistic activity which modernism happens and it gets fragmented into all these strands and then subgenres within subgenres in in popular music and and where we are now is a kind of complete like river delta right of thousands and thousands of little tiny streams um and the question i suppose is how do you get from that back to something that where there's a center of gravity that's the challenge um it's something that's happened in music it's something that's happening in society um it's something that in the last year or so with everything that's happened you know people have literally been fragmented from each other isolated stuck in their own places um it's something that's happened through technology um, you know, I think social media is something I'm a little bit concerned about, although I am on it and uh, I can see that it is addictive and I even find it addictive myself. Um, and, you know, this is one thing I feel lucky about. I remember mentioning to you before as well that I feel grateful to remember a time before the Internet. Actually, I'm probably one of the young people my age are about the youngest people who will remember um, it sort of arriving out of nowhere right um and i remember my dad taking me to a to an internet cafe in cardiff and in the mid 90s or something like that you know before anyone had it at home even and just thinking this isn't very good <laughs> <laughs> there was like five websites and you've got a 
type everything in really slowly and nothing no good content right <laughs> um it took yeah it's a long it's 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 you just thought this this probably won't catch on but you know that's crazy to think now but um yeah people my students age have no it's it's part of it's like air to them you know it's just it's just reality it's just what you're in all the time um and i think it fragments it's it's another kind of fragmentation right i think it fragments people and it's a really um it's a uh, it, it's um insidious kind of one because it it pretends not to be it pretends to be the opposite mm -hmm. right it pretends to connect people but actually if you're spending a lot of time on that you're not seeing people in a real way you're not mm -hmm. connecting with people um yeah. so that concerns me um yeah it's it's a loss of a center of gravity you know that, that there's that yates poem about the center cannot hold and all and um yeah you know the one it's the second coming i think it's called amazing poem i can't remember it properly about um i suppose that particularly is about religion right and this nietzsche thing about the death of god and you there's no uh, you can't fake a belief so where's your where's your sort of pole star gone where's where's your guiding light right um just spiritually where do you build your values from um the relativism that we live in is a, another kind of fragmentation so it's all these different kinds of fragmentation that have happened um and i think it, i see it kind of this is something that's come into the focus through some of the conversations i've had in classes with students as well um is that the challenge is to find ways back from that, you know, to build things, actually, um, to build new centers of gravity. Um, I think it's important. I don't think you can just reflect the lack of a, a center of gravity that now exists. I do somehow see it as my and our duty to, to try and put a stake somewhere and start coagulating or whatever the word is, right? Bringing, bringing things back together. Um, how do you do that? I mean, that's huge, right? And it's you do it in a different way, I suppose, in all of those areas. Um, but I see it, you know, I could even think about little elements of music that, that the, the music that I like does and that my music tries to do, you know, in, in the sort of somehow tries to do that, to, to, to have something that's secure again after a time of real slippery instability for a very long time, you know. So what would I ask Heraclitus? I would ask him <laughs> how, when things have fallen apart like they have, do you just wait for them to come back together or, or do, you, do you try to do something about it? And if it's this, if you try to do something about it, how, how can you do that, you know? I think I've sort of answered it for myself, haven't I? Because I've I've said that we ought to try. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we have to try. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been really fun. My pleasure. <laughs>